Hi, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are continuing our footsteps in the Pacific week. And technically, is Burma and India the Pacific? It's the Southern Hemisphere. The point is, it was an excuse to bring this show to you. And shows about Burma always do very well. Another thing about this show is, as you know, folks, I do like bringing in the big name authors, the Pete Caddick Adams and the John McManuses and Sol Davies. But I also like it when people contact me and say, hey, Paul, I've been studying this. I'd like to talk about that. And they may have contacted me from America or Canada or Australia. And that's really good when those people contact me. And that is what happened today. So, folks, before I bring in my guest, Keith Hathaway, I just want to remind you, if you are new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. The information you need about all the shows is in the description below. So links to people's social media accounts, their books, uh, my social media accounts, merchandise, all that kind of stuff is in the description below. Please consider becoming a patron or even a YouTube mem uh, member so you, of the channel so you help support this so I can keep on going. But I'm going to bring in my guest, Keith Hathaway, 30-year National Guard veteran in the USA, history uh, graduate, been interested in this stuff. And it's interesting and particularly kind of cool to bring an American in who's studying and going to present about the British and indeed the Indian Army in Burma in 1944-45. So I'm going to bring Keith in now. So good afternoon, Keith. How are you today? Good, Paul. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate it. So there we are. There's the question. I mean, an American uh, National Guard veteran, but, you know, rather than write, I mean, you, you, you could be presenting about Guadalcanal or the American, we talked mm -hmm. just a minute ago off camera about the Battle of the Bulge, but what drew you, an American, to the Burma campaign and the Brits? Kohima. Kohima was, uh, I, was in, I was in college. I was at the, I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was in the library and I looked up a looked up uh, history books, came across um, Arthur Swinson's um, Kohima, tore through it, grabbed the next one, Not Ordinary Men, and uh, fell in love with that uh, theater of Burma. Um, and just the, the the makeup of it. It took me a long time to, um, the, the, to realize how important the Indian Army was, because you get the picture of it's all all British soldiers, but it, it's really not. When you look at the old newsreels, it's actually, uh, it's very diversified and it's, it's fascinating how these two and a half million men volunteered and women volunteered for um, to fight the Japanese and keep them out of their country. Well, that, that's and, what we about before. That, that's the revolution, isn't it? Is that, you know, when I was young, it was, it was the Brits in Burma and now we are understanding it's the Duke forces, Commonwealth force, however you want to describe it. And that UK. story is coming out there although of course we have less less west african sources less indian story sources but the thing at least they're being included in the narrative which is great so we're going to go to the battle of sangshak and you'll work on this you come with a powerpoint presentation which i'll control so all we've got to do is to when to move on slides and folks mm -hmm. we'll kind of do questions as we go along today um uh, we've got plenty of maps i think uh, keith will cover pretty much everything as we go along but if if we don't just you know just ask and um, and Keith will be happy to ask your questions. And um, basically, over to you then, Keith. All right. The, um, the, the battle started um, uh, as Japanese in the Operation Yugo. Uh, can we just bring up the next slide? Well, um, this it started with him. Uh, I, th I believe, I feel, the whole conversation about Burma begins and ends with uh, General uh, Field Marshal Slim. Um, the man's very dynamic. I read his book also, uh, Defeat into Victory. It is, it's a cornerstone of study for the Burma campaign, I believe. He reformed an army. Uh, they, they got out, they got pushed out in 42, May of 42. Um, they reformed the army in 43, uh, prepared themselves, retrained, um, set up hospitals behind the lines so they wouldn't lose soldiers for months at a time with malaria or any other thing and he he transformed the training and pushed the the army forward as he prepared for an offensive in 44. the japanese um he knew it's you know slim knew it was coming the japanese prepared uh their own offensive uh because things weren't going well in the pacific in 43 for them they were looking for a place to stop it maybe knock out um, the british out of there push them out of out of india and then uh, maybe turn their attention back to the Americans and the Chinese in uh, in the Pacific in the uh, Chinese. I'm glad you made that point, Keith, because when, when we consider the island hopping campaign by 1944, generally things are going pretty badly for the Japanese. They're losing yes. one thing after another, but the Burma theater is still very much in contention. There's still potential for each side 
to to outwit, outmaneuver, outperform the others, you know, not least of which because of the terrain and weather and monsoons, all those difficulties there we appreciate with, with Burma. So, so you know, we, even on this channel, we often talk about, you know, 1942 as being the pivotal year, but 44, 45, the Burma theatre is still very much... Um, to be decided it's it, and and that's you know brings us to this era here the spring of 44 there's still a year of fighting to go in right, fact, yes. well over a year so um well i'll hand it back to you and right. um we'll keep on going right. um the japanese uh came up with operation you go i want to say mid 43 ish um that's when they decided that they they had to do something um the generals uh, uh renya pushed for it um and finally got his way i believe with tojo and then they made up the plans to to send three divisions up north um, and push into into Dimapur and Kohima and and destroy and fall because that's the main logistics hub. And as war goes, logistics goes. Um, they also had a, a, a earlier uh, James Holland did his book Burma Forty Four for um, the box uh, down in the Arakan. Um, with the with the fifth and the seventh Indian divisions, um, and they fought it out there. But what they surprised um, later on, what they surprised the Japanese with, with being able to move the fifth Indian division with a brigade, the 161st Brigade, to Kohima, and the other two brigades into Imphal by air, and that that speaks volumes of where the army was from 1942. They had um, close to air supremacy. Um, they they could at least fly the um, the cargo planes, C forty six in, into uh, Imphal, and they could forward supply the. They could go into a box. Uh, the British could go into a defensive box, hold out there, re be resupplied by the air, and then um, just have the Japanese smash themselves against the box because they packed light. They expect to take over uh, the, the British Churchill rations, as they called them. You know, whatever they they were used to 1942 or 43 fighting that army. And this is a totally different army that went through and and just revamped itself and redid its logistics, redid. I mean, coming out with with Slim coming out with uh, G, is it jute para, parachutes um, instead of using the expensive silk, silk for men and radios, the other ones for um, the jute just for airdrop. So they, they could support it that way. So as the Japanese moved up um slim had an idea they were coming uh he did three courses of action he could move across the river off the chinwin and attack him that put him at the end of his supply line or he could um take their blow and hold them at the at the uh, chinwin river or they could possibly he could go back in and surround the supply bases shortening his base of supply and lengthening the japanese logistics lines and that third part is what he chose to do. He, and just a question he, for you. Uh, Scott Grimman is asking about if if troops are flown in, who is doing the air transport at this point of the war? Um, I want to say a, a large amount of Americans, but also British flying uh, flying those planes that were uh, lend lease uh, sent out to them. And from the hump, um, when this all started, uh, Mountbatten had to uh, push away the uh, the combined chiefs and say I can't give you those planes back or he delayed them because they were flying for the hump to keep the Chinese invested in the war so we could tie down all those um, Japanese soldiers there's quite a few of them in China so if they were to ultimately conquer China they would be free to go back into the Pacific or into India. Okay. Are we ready for the next map now? Yes, please. So this this is Sangshak. So, um, uh, but people love the good the, a good map. So, yeah. I'll let you explain what what we're looking at. All right. This is the um, this is the initial positions. The brigade, the fiftieth brigade on the lower left, is coming in. They're a parachute brigade. Um, they've they've done their parachute training, and as I said before, the um, in a British brigade you have three three battalions, and generally in the Indian uh, brigade you have a maybe a Gurkha, a British, and a uh, Indian uh, battalion to make up the, th the and then other other units, you know, engineer units to support them, or artillery units to support them. So this this unit was training. Uh, they were getting ready for a mission, a jump. It didn't go through. 
the brigade commander, we're gonna see him a little uh, a little longer, the brigadier, he said, we gotta keep these soldiers because you can't train soldiers and not have them do something. So he he went out, talked to fourth corps. They, they approved his plan to go out and get uh, jungle training because they'd already done their jump training. But unfortunately, um, there, earlier on, there was a British battalion, the 151st, who got into a scrap with the American Americans, I believe the air pilots, and they got moved back to the Middle East and ultimately end up in Arnhem. Um, and then they only had the two, uh, the 152nd, 153rd, and 154th. The 154th was left behind so it could finish its jump training. And and But they, they backfilled them with a unit that was already there the 23rd indian division was in the operating in the area and they left the fourth of the fifth moder moderata uh, and they would rip out the positions re relief in place um they would just switch them out and that's this is where we stand uh 0800 19 march the some of the the brigade headquarters at mile mile marker 36 they're they're getting ready because they're replacing the uh, brigade headquarters and Linton is was the 49th brigades of the 23rd Indian division was its supply route the uh, supply area so they could forward deploy the the units there um the C company that's one's going to play a big part um they all laid out that way um as the Japanese come on there's uh, a 900 um well, initially, 200 Japanese are spotted on the trail coming towards them. Uh, they they cross the river. Uh, 15 March. Uh, they don't. The British aren't aware of it, or um, the intelligence isn't getting to the brigade as they're filling in to train. They had um, they had some units. They still had other units up on the top. The 153rd is still coming in from Kohima, driving down and. And as, as the battle develops, they can only get 390 out of a 620 man force because they leave behind their engineers, their logistics people. They bring a small slice of headquarters people and some of their mortars. As this develops, uh, the third battalion of the 58th on the far right, Japanese, they come up, they find this position, uh, point 0.7378. They dug in, it's a former position from the Mataratas, they they improve the position and they're waiting for the for the Japanese um, long range patrols is really what they're there for. Keep them out, secure our rear area because no one's expecting the Japanese to come up through here. Slim expected um, Slim excuse me. Slim expected a, a regiment at best to come up to Kohima. He knew it was coming because they had the the intelligence that they were coming, but no one passed it down to the 50th Brigade. Um, and so they they cross the river, they come on. Nagas, who are the indigenous pe people in the area, um, and V Force, which you've you've talked about before, Paul V Force, um, the you know British um, tea planters or people that grew up in the area knew knew the villagers and could operate behind Japanese lines. And they were they were stationed along the um, the Chindwin River and. They know they were coming on the on the night of the 18th. Um, their their outpost gets attacked because Japanese had done long range patrolling in the area and knew that they had a a long range set to get back to Fourth Corps back in Imphal. They take that out. They attack it. Uh, wound uh, Colonel um, Murray Murray um, and move uh, move towards point seventy three seventy eight. And the Japanese aren't um, aren't expecting much resistance, but the point seventy three seventy eight is very well defended. It's a whole company, about one hundred seventy soldiers, with with infantry support. I'm sorry, with mortar support and a section of machine guns. And Major Fuller's, you can see Major Fuller's the commanding officer. The it, the reason for it is is the jeep tracks because it's an avenue of advance for the enemy for the Japanese. They knew that what was there. Um, initial reports were we had 200 or 300 Japanese moving up the track from the from the um, Nagas, and then later on, an officer patrol estimates it to be at 900 soldiers. The engagement starts um, on the 19th, and ultimately, um, they they reports are coming back. We're engaged. We're fighting. 
Uh, the, the commanding officer, Major Fuller, is wounded. The second in command is wounded. Um, they, they push back. Um, they push the Japanese out, but they come in, and eventually, by morning, it's it's just about it's just about over. Um, the Japanese have surrounded surrounded them. At the final one one telling point, and this happens also. One telling point is 20, 20 paratroopers attack forward. They rush out. One British officer stands on the parapet and shoots himself in the head. The rest of the paratroopers are either captured or fall into a gully that they didn't know was in front of them. The Japanese are so shocked because they know that's not in the British military tradition for, for that. That's more their tradition. They knew instantly they were fighting different types of soldiers. They knew this was not their regular enemy that they were going to take. Um, the, the one British officer, Eaton, and 20 ranks returned to the brigade further down at um, Gammon. It's another, it's a position on the map. There, there's more going on. The next map will show um, the relief columns. This is a, this is the, this is the, um, the map. I had my daughter take her iPad out of the, and we took a copy of the war diary. And this is an exact copy. It's just, she brought it more to life and, and put it out because it, the, um, the commander of the 152nd was going to leave that company out there on its own. He requested the assistance from a company of the fourth of the fifth Madras and I believe his, um, B, B company. And they, the B company was lost in the woods when they tried to get to the jungle. If anyone knows a compass at night in the jungle, you're not gonna, you know, it's gonna be hard. They ended up coming a half mile away as the position fell. This unit uh, launched from New Guinea, which was on the map and they, they attack forward and they keep trying to flank the Japanese because the Japanese expected them to be there. They didn't, um, they, they came forward, they flanked, but then the Japanese put in their reserves um, and they had a lot more men available as they were reducing the position on 73, 78, because that was a known, known path and a known expected route of advance. So the, the British here couldn't hold, they were down to 39 men in the company out of original about 70, <coughs> excuse me, about 70 soldiers. And they, they evacuated as the Japanese started flanking them. They started pulling back into rare area, into uh, layup areas that they had previously planned. And they wanted to um, delay them, take care of the, the wounded. The wounded goes back to Gammon and try the Badger, sorry. Badger tries to push him back because they know the 152nd brigades there with another company and they can find rest. As the Japanese are, are just hot on their trail, um, the men get surprised by uh, uh, 81 millimeter mortar team from the British coming up. They take up positions, stop the Japanese, push them back a little. They allow them to pull back to Gammon. Um, and then the Japanese try and flank their positions, but they knew they knew it was coming. They called, um, they, they were digging in ready for a, a box, building a box and waiting for a fight on Gammon. And they, um, they called for an air resupply. Well, it came in and the Japanese thought they were gonna, um, they were going to stay there and fight it out. But the British had orders and we'll get into that in a minute. The British had orders to pull back because at this point, the second in command of the 50th uh, brigade realized we can't be in penny packets. Mm -hmm. We're going to get destroyed piecemeal. So he advised uh, the brigade commander, we need to pull back to another point. They originally thought point 36, but in a uh, mile, sorry, mile marker 36, because that was the original spot, but it's not really, it wasn't really defendable. So he picked Sangshack. And I just want to jump in while, while you're taking yep. a drink of water there, is, is, is that, you know, you mentioned about the, the use of the box and, you know, the, the putting people in one place. And it kind of echoes back to the Napoleonic Square in, in some senses. Yes. Everyone knows where they are within this. But the period you've just been talking about is that that unpredictable phase of, of warfare in Burma in that, you know, even an estimation of there might be a thousand Japanese coming towards you. Well, on the time you're there, how wide is the trail? Is the trail there or has it been washed away because of the last rains? Are they going to come 200 yards to the left or 500 meters to the right? right. Are they about to envelop us because the, the jungle and the terrain playing that important part there? And so 
maximizing your force, whether you're the Japanese or British or Indian in whatever case, is very difficult depending on the terrain. You might have lots of people behind you on a trail, but they can't go into action because it's so the jungle's so thick. So it seems that this this period prior to establishing a box is really interesting because aside with superior manpower is is in the in the ETO might be dominant but in this area it all depends on exactly what the terrain is these little little actions happen as to who has the upper hand is that yes. am I making some sense yeah there? you're you could uh, uh, um that's what slim had a uh, hard time with with uh, the um combined chiefs back in, in London telling them this this battle could be a squad section a squad you know a section yeah. fight it could be a platoon fight it could be a company fight they uh in ETO, they used to bring in battalions on, you know, battalion maneuver, battalions and divisions. Here, uh, just a little, little mud could hold you up, similar to Co uh, the Kokoda Trail. Uh, a little bit of mud could just throw a uh, throw a wrench into everything. So, um, one thing I'd like to point out here is that that roadblock, which is um, in the middle of the page, uh, some goes the um, some things that go unnoticed is. The, it was an Indian, um, Jemada, if I pronounce that correctly. He was the lieutenant, and he pushed the attack um, on his, his platoon's attack. And they, um, he was so fierce, he got up to the roadblock, took out a couple of machine guns. He ended up getting um, the Indian Distinguished Service Medal. So that um, that, that that shows the fierceness of the fight and how how willing these soldiers will fight for each other. Because we know, it's, you know, it's not for the things back home. So it's, it's for the yeah. guy next to you. Of course. Um, that that was the that was the relief force. Uh, they never got to them, unfortunately, and they were wiped out. The Japanese were seen burying uh, Nagas reported, and also patrols reported the Japanese burying the soldiers from point seventy three seventy eight on the side of the road wow. after the battle. And then at this point, like I said before, the the brigade commander realized what's going on. He needs to pull all his soldiers back into a combined area. And he picked saying shack. Now he took a lot of, he took a lot of um, criticism for that in, in later years, because uh, I have another slide that'll show why, um, why that was, but um, I'm ready to go next slide. All right. There's the, there's the man. He's um, the general Japanese general. There are two Japanese generals in every division. One that leads the infantry group, one that commands the division. This gen this uh, general is is traveling with the left assault unit of the 31st Infantry Division. He's commander of the 31st Infantry Group. He's got three he's got three um, battalions with him: the first, the 58th, the second, and the third of the 58th. The third was the one engaged at point 7378. He makes a decision to move that. Um, to move on the British as they're pulling back, going into Sang Shack. It's a, it's kind of a fighting withdrawal. The British put out some, um, some blocking units, some, uh, nothing happens and they, they have to run back into the uh, perimeter six miles back. The other ones, um, they get called in, uh, there's a little conjecture as far as did they really have a, the machine gun company was up at, uh, your, your call. Um, I apologize for my, uh, pronunciations they they were told to um they were told to pull back burn the supplies and get in here um but then the japanese said they had a skirmish with them so it's 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 that history thing where you don't really know what the i can't say truth but you don't know what what really happened because everyone sees a different picture of what happened yeah. so he he's coming down from the uh he's coming down from the north falling into sang shack um, one of the sergeants does run up a little story. One of the one of the color sergeants in in uh, the battalion runs up to him and hands him um, a bottle of whiskey, a scotch. So um, he's he's very aggressive. Um, he's later on uh, at Kohima, but he is uh, he's the man directing the battle right at the moment. And and Sangshak is not in his area of um, his zone. Um, it was actually the 15th division zone on their right wing and he's on the left wing. He's just aggressive. Doesn't want to leave British paratroopers or any British units 10 miles in his rear as he's to mess up his supply lines, his logistics. So he decides we're going to make a, um, we're going to make an attack. Uh, and 
Yeah, and there's yeah. the there's the order of battle there. And just a, a quick, a quick, uh, an easy question. Well, not a, a different question, but I want to have a simple answer to it. Really, by this point of the war, how, how does a does a Japanese infantry group this communicate? Obviously, they've got limited amount of radios, but that's all again range, conditions, Runner. weather, battery, and yeah. runners as well. But do, do they have a sense of uh, allowing autonomy to junior unit leaders? I mean, certainly the British and Indians by this point have, have realized the benefit of, of good NCOs, good junior officers. And, you know, and Slim realizes he can't man manage, as you said yourself, every single action. It could, be, every action could be of an indeterminate size. But the Japanese, do they allow a certain amount of control at a lower level or is it all generals dictating things like it is in the war film? It, it's, yeah, it's, that's how Slim beat them. You'll go down this road, five times if you have to but the in the british by that point know you're coming down that road and we'll just set up an ambush and wait for you uh the junior officers are very aggressive um when the when given a mission um they they move out fast um there was a little breakdown here at sang shack where one of the company commanders ha had a breakdown in front of his troops um and he finally got it back together which uh, the person that wrote it was shocked that he saw his company commander have that have an issue um so they they are very aggressive but they're very told um they're not like german soldiers where they you're told take this but they're not told how to take it they're told you'll take it this way so yes the japanese have you know very aggressive but they're also their army is about to face a 1944 army when they're fighting in a 41 40 1940-42 army. Yeah, that, 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 that would be the point if Rob Lyman was here, is that the Japanese are pretty much still doing it the same way. They conquered everything now three years earlier, whereas the British are and the, and the, and the Commonwealth troops are, are completely, you made that point yourself, a, a completely different force that, yes. than they were, that everything has changed. Every, that the ideas have come and gone, concepts have come and gone, doctrine has evolved and changed. Mm -hmm. and, a very very different army now than the army of three years earlier so um um yeah that that and as you will explain and I'll, that's that's the sense of the the, the reason for the, a lot of the japanese downfall but let's let's move to um the british hero in charge of these these, these plucky um indian paras paras um, yes um, um, he uh he's the brigadier uh mrj hope thompson thompson uh, commander of the 50th Indi uh, Indian Parachute Brigade. He wasn't the first commander. The other the other commander was believed to be too old uh, at a 40-year-old man to jump uh, and handle the conditions. They brought him in. Um, he was 31 when he initially took over the brigade, 32 at the time of the battle. He, um, he came from the UK with all the latest techniques for, para dro for uh, parachute dropping. Um, so that's that's why he's there. Um, he's he's an, uh, a nice enough guy, but I don't think he warmed up to his junior officers much or, or his other officers. He's approachable, but he's not um, overly friendly. Right. Yeah. Um, the next next slide is the and uh, this is it might might be a little small. I apologize for that. Um, this is. The layout as much as I could find of who was in there. Now, the moderatas are 100 soldiers down. Um, the 153rd is uh, should have been at 620 soldiers. They're down. Um, some of the things about um, the battle, which is interesting, I'm digging in more, is the Kali Badoa regiment right there, uh, about three quarters of the way down. People talk about them, um, but they don't say what they what they did. Sometimes they'll talk about they they uh, counterattacked, but no one talks about what the exact units A, B, C, you know, Alpha Company, Charlie Company. Um, they don't talk about that. And one of the things I found is a detachment of the seventy fourth. It was in the um, it was in the brigade's war war diary, and they talk about getting attacked. But even in the seventy fourth field companies. War diary, they don't make any mention of them being there. I mean, that's some of the stuff that fascinates me. Um, that that they're there, but no one really talks about them. Um, there's kind of to me, reading there are two books that I read on it that um, that kind of contradicted each other. One was Seaman. Um, he was a lieutenant in the 153rd, because there was a little uh, slight put against the brigade at the 
at the end of the battle, and then it carried out as a black mark throughout the rest of the uh, confrontation. Um, and he wrote the book when Lewis Allen wrote his section on on the um, on Sang Shack and on that battle. So he wanted to um, try and set the record straight. I think he favored. Um, you can read the the divisions history on the twenty third division about the Moderatas, and there they have a whole chapter dedicated to what they did. And some of it contradicts and some of the, like I said, you don't know what people really, you know, what the actual um, part was and what they actually did. But there was some, um, there's a little, little bad blood there because of what the moderators wrote, um, saying like the 152nd gave way at one point, they couldn't stand. And at the end, you'll see the, you'll see the casualties, the 152nd takes. It's, um, it's brutal. Um most of the company's gone, most of the battalion's gone because they've already lost a company at point 173, I'm sorry, 73, 78. And they, they pushed out, that company's gone and all they have is a small headquarters section and two line companies and to hold their position of the, um, of the perimeter. Um, so some of the things I'd like to dig in a little more and you can find uh, is that the London Gazette that publishes the, the, um, the, not the war diaries, but publishes their awards. You can look yeah, online, yeah. find the awards, and match them up. I have a few of them. You can match them up. It's fascinating. Um, and a lot of the Indian soldiers did get recognized. Um, uh, they did. They did very well. And one of the, you know, one of the lieutenants in the uh, in the uh, mountain battery ended up being the, the uh, chief of staff of the Indian Army later on in the seventies, I believe. Um, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, a brilliant outline that and, and reminding ourselves of just even within this one one brigade, there are all these different uh, cultural, national, religious um, language ling you know, factions. And and as we said right at the beginning, very, very few of them really wrote much down. You know, we argue about what people did, for example, at Arnhem, when you get all sorts of reports of sergeants, company commanders within the same company even. And at this, with such a vast force, I, I, you know, there were so just a handful of accounts written, and of course they're going to be contradictory. And there's that post-war period where India has its own politics, Nepal. Uh, there's there's lots of reasons why this stuff wasn't um, written about in the 50s and 60s. There's lots going on there, but it's yes. it's, it's great to, to mention it all uh, to us now. So we'll we'll keep on moving. So the terrain. Let's talk about the terrain. Terrain composition. Um, the Nagas, the indigenous people in the area, which were very good to British and Indian soldiers, um, it assisted greatly. Um, and Robert, uh, Robert Lyman will talk about the KET, Kohima Educational Trust, um, for the second division, um, that they, they really supported the British during, during the battle. Um, Sang Shack was a typical Naga village, 20 to 30 wooden huts, um, scattered. There's a, um, the West Slope when I show that there's West Hill and then there's a salt, a gully, but, um, that was the word they used. I wouldn't use the word gully as our, you know, traditional thinking. The dominant feature, which would play a big part, is the wooden church in the corner, which was a little bit higher than the surrounding terrain, and that's why it's dominant. Um, the problem with it is the, um, the thick wild rhododendrons came right up to the brigade defensive position. We'll point those out. And the position overlooked, the, the significance, why he picked it is because, why the brigade, brigadier picked it was the position overlooked the Jeep track to block the Japanese from moving around them. Um, West Hill, that was the other one that, that gets dominated by the, the church. And at the bottom, that which will play, it was a sheer foot, 12 foot drop coming down the plateau, hitting the road, uh, and then drops another 3,000 feet as, as, uh, as we get into the battle. Um, so the British are going to, um, use this position again the brigadier takes a lot of a lot of um there you go he takes a lot of uh um abuse for his decision but he he everything he had around him he had this was the best he had this, I mean, it's, it's going to be obvious in that kind of terrain, any position you make a stand at is going to be a, the case of the lesser of evils. It's 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 jungle, it's mountains, it's climate. It's not like Sandhurst maneuvers where you, you're going to have to mm -hmm. pick something. OK, well, it's a compromise between this, this and this. And, and yeah, yeah, it's understandable. There is no such thing as a perfect place to, to, come, to set up a defense in this kind of terrain. It's just 
it goes against the nature of what this this train is like. But um, I'm glad you're gonna you're gonna specify these particular yeah. weaknesses now because it will fra frame the battle for us. It it was a bald hill. It was just grass. Um, there were a few huts up there, but they ordered them to be taken down. Um, there was a tree or two, not a clump of trees, but a tree or two on the position there. Um, if someone goes out, Googles it, you can see where it is. Um, the the big point is um, in in um, Siemens book, he says there's no barbed wire for the, for the Commonwealth forces um, because they couldn't move it forward. When they first made the decision to move back to Sang Shack, that was they asked for ammunition, medical supplies, food. And particularly wire because wire will stop a japanese force from rushing into your perimeter so you can get some sleep at night at least four hours you can operate on well what the uh, fourth of the fifth moderatas did was use panjis um, as barbed wire and place them because they were the more experienced jungle fighters the whole reason the paras were there was to get that experience and they they didn't have time to assimilate into the jungle training and that's they really wanted that that training but um, the Madaras pushed that out there and they booby trapped um, as they're setting up the position. The Madaras, uh, they had an engineer uh, platoon with them and they took 81 millimeter mortar rounds and booby trapped them in exposed um, trenches. So the Japanese would jump into the fighting position and trip the wires. <clears> then <throat> that's how they, they set up their positions around, the, um, around there. And now they have, um, there is a map, I'll, I'll talk to that. If, there you go. There's there's the view of modern slide in 1984. It goes uh, pretty much the same. You can Google um, you can Google Earth it. Um, that slope I was talking about with the rhododendrons appears to still be there. <clears throat> the um, you can see West Hill to the left. Um, the church is there, um, and and there that this is what they came into, but with a few less um, huts. And one of the big points is if you see that soccer pitch on the right, on the left photo, on the right middle, that's that's one of the flattest places in in uh, in Assam. Right. They'll they'll play a part. Okay. So maps again, and this yep. is, we've got several of these as we go through the stage of the battle. So so back to you again. Yep. All right. Um, the first attack came in on the twenty second. They. They're finally getting all the soldiers in there. The 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 soldiers congregating, coming in. Um, at this point, the one one fifty third is just coming into Sang Shack. The one fifty second hasn't gotten there yet. They're still pulling back through the roads and jungles. The brigadier, as uh, the D Company of the Fourth of the uh, MLI, was sent back out half mile away delay the Japanese so we can collect everybody because the mules are still coming in with the guns. The trucks are showing up with uh, the mortars and everyone's trying to get consolidated. The position wasn't ready for a defense. Um, you can look at, I have, I have the war diaries of the Kali Badoa, and unfortunately I'm missing the month of March. It's not in the archives. Um, but if you look at Feb, you know, January, February, um, they're, they're preparing positions every day, but when when the uh, fourth or fifth comes in, they're assigned three 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 uh, three fighting positions for a whole for a whole battalion. Um, the I think that upsets the battalion commander a little, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Trim, and they get to digging as fast as they possibly can. But they throw one uh, D company who just got back in the perimeter, push them back out, stop them, and he got the military medal for his actions. The uh, one of the big things is the, the second in command of the brigade saw the action and he said he never he had never seen uh, a company handled so well. Not a not a casualty in the lot. They all got back to the perimeter. He used the mortars skillfully that he had a section of mortars, two, two 81 millimeter mortars with him. Stop the Japanese. When we're saying 81, are we talking British three inch or are they actually yes, using British three inch three inch? Yeah. yeah. Just, just, uh, just talking at cross purposes because of our of our divided language because of yeah. our, our, our Atlantic between us. Yeah, super, no, no problem. Yeah. And the, um, so the the first attack is the whole. This first night is conducted by the uh, second battalion. 
Um, they are a very aggressive um, commander. He he begs the general, let's put in an attack without artillery. They're just an infantry battalion, and the Japanese have 70 millimeter um, field guns or mountain guns with them, and they have no they only mortars are the knee mortar that they use, the 50 millimeter knee mortar. So the first 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 attack comes over that hill um, on the one on the 153rd. Well, they're Gurkhas and they're excellent marksmen, and they have Sten guns, and they're waiting. And they're waiting, and Seaman says he hears the click of the click of the weapons. The safety's off, and they wait as the Japanese come rolling, uh, come boiling over that west hill up on the left corner. Ninety out of one hundred and twenty dead or wounded. They counted eighty-nine in an officer um, when they were done. They did hit. They did get a little in the perimeter. Um, it will be significant because one of the one of the Japanese officers. I've seen it a lieutenant ban, or I've seen it a uh, captain ban. He's in, he gets in the position, cuts down four soldiers, and they bury him with full military honors. They, they take care of him. The second attack is on the uh, lower down across the football, uh, they call it football field, across the pitch. Later at night, um, the first attack was at dusk. The next attack was probably eight, nine o'clock at night. They come in, same thing. They take 30 casualties right away. Um, they said they've had enough and they pull back for the night. During the night, there's a, like I said, the right, uh, the right group of the 15th division um, on the far right by the um, moderatas by Sheldon's corner in that direction. They get hit by a, um, a Japanese company uh, reinforced, uh, but they're not here to stick around. They have other things to do. They heard that they heard the sound of the firing move to their friends Um they go up and down the line all around the um, all around the box on the right side or that the east side and they don't get anywhere um, they break off the attack and move on with their previous mission next that, that was the night of the 22nd and just just to clarify with this keith uh the attacks can come in from pretty much any one of the directions 360 degrees yes but they're also keeping them their own lines in the fact there are some of their own units still meant to be coming to re reinforce them. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking if that if I'm right on that, that's yes. a typical and, and strategic, you know, kind of nightmare. You could be attacked in any direction, but you've also got your own resupply units coming in from, in. Yes. from different directions as well. I mean, it's just, and all this with, with terrain and, cli and climate and darkness as well. I mean, mm -hmm. very, very, very confusing situation. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to point out that the um, up on the left, where it says March 22nd, that's the plateau I was speaking of. It's yeah. an ancient volcano. Um, it's obsidian, three to five feet down. You, you, they can't dig in that deep. So they're getting when when the artillery starts landing on them later in the battle, they're just in a in a trench, three to five feet down, that they can't respond to. It just it, and I imagine the obsidian is just like granite or glass cutting through you as it hits the <clears throat> as it hits the soldiers. So I'll move on to the 23rd yeah. then. So, um, All right. yeah. Um, aerial resupply begins, um, and it's, it's a quiet day. This sniping, there is a, a light infantry attack. I believe on my research, it's the 10th company um, of, uh, of the, of the um, 58th. Um, they, they're, the supply lines uh, are now, they're in a box formation. And the only way to get supplies is, is power drop. And they drop. Um, they tell them, they tell the, because uh, they're, they're skilled. The powers are skilled with air, air resupply because that's their, that's how they operate. Instead of, and they told the, they told um, the Air Force, uh, the RAF, uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, to fly along the length of the position. But they don't. Everyone flies along the width, the, the shortest part, and they watch these supplies day after day drop into the hands of the Japanese. There is one, one pilot who operated, who trained with, with the powers. Low and slow, he came in and he dropped everything he had in the position. So they, they found him and they said they owed him a beer when this was over. Um, uh, that's, that, that was the night of the uh, 23rd. Well, the day of the 20th, a lot of sniping. 
this unit is the right assault unit that shows up. Um, there, it's it's short. Um, it's the second and the the third um, battalions, but they're short companies because what the Japanese did is they took in every battalion, every infantry battalion, they took out one of their companies. They would normally have four companies with a machine gun. Um, and they took they took out one of the companies to move the animal transport to for the for the mules for the uh, elephants and and that when they attack they're short in this unit particularly its company strength is a hundred men so it's 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 short as it is um, and one gun the, the battalion guns get into position but they don't it's they, the guns attack and they add weight to the to the attack but they don't. Um, the infantry don't attack because the colonel doesn't want to be as aggressive as the 58th was. He told his company commanders, you're going to fight this battle. You look over the space, and when you're ready, we'll, you know, we'll attack in a day or two. So, so they are surrounded, but they're not uh, pressed on the right because they came in from the, from the right side. Um, 24th, the day is getting on. The 3rd. Third uh, regiment, third battalion again launches another company strength attack. This this time they're wearing down. Company strength attacks are 120 men now. They're they're not the 150 men you, you originally had because you're wearing down. Um, the fatigue is is on the on the company like much like Kohima. Um, they try to bury the the remains, uh, but they can't because there's no positions available. The the medical facilities are are um, are bleak. Um, cause they, they have what they have when they showed up. Um, so they, they do a combined assault, um, with the second and the third battalion. And even at that, it doesn't, it doesn't give any way. Um, but the, but the one fifty second up on the right, uh, sorry, top left is getting worn down. Like I said, they only had two companies. They didn't have a full battalion anymore and they are getting worn down. They're getting excellent support from the field guns because there are four 3.7 inch uh, mountain guns, and they could drop them on counter battery fire on the Japanese surrounding the area, and they could they could drop it um, right on attacking attacking Japanese soldiers. And that 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 was the day um, they're looking for resupply, and it, it comes, but again, not enough. The battalion, the Brig brigadier, wants to break out and attack Saint Shack Village, which is already burned down. Um, they have a conference, and they're like, we we. The other officers, the battalion commanders, we can't do this because we don't have enough ammunition for for offensive action. We only have it for defensive action. So, um, so again, they're dropping in. They they are getting some mortar rounds um, landed by parachute. They are getting some three point seven inch uh, ammunition simulated by parachute. Um, it's one of those situations, Keith, where it's it's never going to be enough, is it? It's, no, it's, no. No matter yeah. how much is coming in. Yeah, on, on an action like this that's lasting several days where you're surrounded and there's attacks coming in uh, the, the only way to deal with it is try and keep superior firepower on the enemy and that means going through your ammunition is it that's the, the only that's the only yes. advantage they've got is just w when the attack comes in lay down concentrations of fire and that that is that serves its purpose but you're going to whip through your ammunition whether it's mortar rifle machine gun really really quickly so it's it, it must have been very, very, very stressful for the commanders and those I mean, in, charge, yes. in charge of just distribution of ammunition. You know, a soldier, especially in, at, at night, you know, you just want to fire as much as you've got. But it's and they told, yeah, to be key. They told them not to move around at night, like friendly lines. You'd be, you'd be shot. Uh, there is a case where it's not dawn yet, but it's coming up. Uh, a Gurkha position got a bunker got hit. There's two, two dead Gurkhas and one very wounded soldier and they can hear him screaming out in the night but they can't move out to go help him because their own side would shoot them for moving around at night because what the japanese were doing on that top northern part where it says march 22nd over to water point and even down a little ways on the right there was um those where the wild rhododendrons were and the japanese would rush uh, a, a officer and four soldiers into the position at night to unnerve the british and the uh, Gurkhas. Which would un unnerve anyone, um, and they would get. They at one point they got in amongst the the aid station, and they got they got pushed back out. But it was a um, it was no there was no barbed wire to stop that, and that's a big complaint on 
uh, Siemens book that mm -hmm. they they asked begged for it. Yeah. Are we moving on to the twenty fifth? Yeah. Yes, we are. I'll move it. Um, so yes, this is um this is a big attack. It's about um. 150 soldiers it's combined it's composite attack from the japanese uh they know they have to take the church out because it gives overwatch position of the uh of the british or commonwealth forces um and they they rush in there um hand-to-hand -hand fighting 15 soldiers are in there for the british um they finally uh fight it out they push them back out at the end of the time all the time the 60th um the 60th regiment wants to coordinate with uh, the 58th and the Ge general uh, Miya Miyazaki. The liaison officer that goes out to talk to the general gets screamed at because doesn't he know a soldier's compassion? Because the 58th is going to take this position. You can have, he said, you can have whatever you want when this is over, but we're the ones taking this position because we fought and earned it wow. um, instead of taking their, their assistance and pushing them out. Um, so um that's that's it that's that's the 25th again sniping uh the water point is big the main water point is down the left by the school but it's outside the perimeter they can't get to it the water parties do go out at night for the madaraz there's two it's not shown here but there's another water point they go out um at night fill up canteens and try and come back in or, and any rainstorm that comes soldiers are using the helmets or whatever they can to catch water because that is a dwindling resource and i, I just I'm, I, I'm not as familiar with burma battles as i am normandy but i mean i know from normandy often sort of set piece battles three days four days tops is when they tend to run out of steam is this an unusually prolonged battle for, for this kind of theater and campaign i'm thinking back to thinking the other shows i've done hill 170 is that yeah is, is are both sides do they ever well not obviously the, the the british indians are defending but the, the japanese ever kind of think of just pulling back and and and, and leaving it for a few days before continuing because yeah, the defenders aren't going to be going anywhere i suppose or is it now get to a point you mentioned the kind of the pride of i'm with the regiment doing it without is there a bit of kind of hubris and pride coming into it now yes the general wants his uh, for his own he's yeah. his his soldiers have paid for it they want it um, they're coming down now they're in now they've, they've had yeah. losses even if pulling back may be the better thing to do that you've, you've you cross the line this is the, not revenge is a strong word but it's like continue now till there's a conclusion conclusion it. yeah it's gonna yep. be and the, um the the position here on the 26th um the japanese break in they get by the church they get to that gray line at the top on the plateau and the problem is now they can look down into the position their issue is they're almost out of soldiers um the the japanese they're down there are eight guys in one in one company that got in and that's all that's left of them um they broke in on the right a little and and up on the top left later on the the second second regiment on that lower left arrow they'll attack across there they take 30 casualties and said that's you know that's enough they pull back from the uh, 153rd and lick their wounds and get ready for the next day because they're talking the 60th Regiment is talking about making the big push tomorrow on the 27th. And that's that's the big day. This day is filled with counterattacks. Um, there's a lieutenant that was part of the uh, defensive brigade defensive platoon. He talked to one of his friends. What are you doing? He goes, I think it's a counterattack. He's combing his hair, getting ready for a counterattack. And within five minutes, he's dead. Because he takes 30 soldiers and they they do an attack because they have to push the Japanese out of that out of that section and it just doesn't happen um, ready for the next which brings us to the the kind of the, the twist in the tale is that it is the withdrawal and and i'll be intrigued when we get to that point in a few minutes about the how, how we classify this battle because it's it, it's it's such an odd one but yeah i'll let you explain this first then we'll kind of analyze it in a minute this is um this is the night the previous slide i had on there 1800 hours they get a message order withdrawal they question it because it's in clear go um i believe it's go south and then head west transport and planes will be looking out for you um they they get a uh, an o meeting at the uh, brigade headquarters and they're they're stunned they we're you know we're going to pull out they have to it's, it's over um you'll see the casualties in the next couple of slides 
Um, this, I believe, 450 soldiers in the aid station. Um, and we know what, you know, World War II Japanese soldiers do to wounded soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so they're getting ready. They, they take soldiers and they give them uh, wounded. Take your friend with you as you go to break out. Um, they all say goodbye to their friends at the brigade. Um, and they're going to move through the 4th of the 5th Mataraz Light Infantry, that their right side. Um, remember I said about that 12-foot drop? Yep. One of the, yeah. One of the uh, battalion commanders slips and goes 12 feet and lands hard on his on his legs. Um, so they're, they're getting in the platoon size. They're getting ready to go. The order is given. They fire, uh, I want to say, 2,200 hours. All the machine gun rounds they had, they had a, um, a 10 machine gun company. A couple of them have already been uh, in the battle wiped out. Uh, they fire all the mortar rounds. They fire all the, their remaining artillery rounds, and it's silence. The Japanese feel the British are going to make an attack now. But then when they go to move out, nothing happens. It's just quiet. It's the night still. They get the men together, and they move out, and they take their friends uh, down that slope down down into the um down into that three thousand foot gully um so they it takes them days if not weeks to get back some of them are captured um as far as uh they captured by the japanese and they're they're uh handled very well um they're just not killed outright as a, um as the japanese move into the position because it's quiet nothing's going on and there are 150 soldiers left because they can't can't move them. The medical officer, the 80th uh, field ambulance, said, "I'd like to stay." The brigadier said, "You're not going to because that'd just be a waste." Because they, what they feel is going to happen to the, all the soldiers left behind. Um, and they move up. They move out in small groups. They run into Japanese patrols over the next few days, and um, they they do get back to and fall and they reform. Um, the next slide, Paul. Here are the um, casualties. Um, yeah, um, it's only going to be a, not a hundred percent accurate, but remind us of the the total size when the box was at its peak of how many British Commonwealth soldiers were, were in that environment. Um, that it was about eighteen twenty, eighteen fifty. Um, right. for all everything I found, um, those those losses are are incredible. I've gone through some of the war diary uh, war diaries for the British to find, like the Moderatas was off a little. I, I looked some of that, some of those. Um, Kali Bador, I had, like I said, I have Aprils. So I, I counted the number of other ranks and Nepalese officers that come, that came back and two British liaison officers came back with them because they were part of the Nepalese army. Um, and, and I didn't find anything in D troop. Now there's a lot of talk, um, online about how badly, um, they, they were wounded, but they, they went out, I believe they went out as a section. They, they stuck together and, and moved out. Um, the Japanese, it varies. It all depends who you who you read. It's anywhere from five, 500 to 1,000. Um, very, uh, very little information. The, the issue I'm having is finding Japanese sources. I can find British sources, which kind of lead to, to uh, Indian sources, but I can't find a lot of Japanese sources. They're out there, but they're not in English, mm -hmm. and I can't find them, so... Um, that it, the the nah, next one's next slide. Sorry, sorry, Paul. I mean, well, just, I just want to just go. Yeah, before we move on, just just kind of yeah. break that down. I mean, this this is you know, this is incredibly significant. I mean, this you know, it it is. Which is eighty percent casualty rate is that you know that's 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 not little. Um, even the ones with the minor losses, twenty five percent of the of the, of the mountain battery. I mean, you know, obviously, it's killed. 60, wounded. Yeah, sixty men in the mountain battery and twenty five percent loss. It's, yeah. It's, is in, this is incredible, but we'll we'll move on and 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 um and look at the effects because that's where I'm, you know I, I didn't my introduce I do, is it is it a British defeat is it a Japanese defeat is it a draw is it a Japanese is it a strategic victory but a, a tactical I mean it's it, I guess it has been debated yeah. exactly yeah. what this battle is um and and how it how it I mean I'll let you explain the point there I think the first yeah. line is is pertinent yeah. there isn't it Yes, his he's a week late getting to Kohima because he's so aggressive because he. He disobeys his orders and he goes after the Paris where he could have left um, in Lewis Allen's book. 
veterans of the 15th division said, yeah, we we're moving slow, but we would have got there and the same results would have happened. We would have taken the position, but they, they say, you know, the 58th did the, the lion's share of the fighting. Um, they, Kohima was a big position. It gave uh, Fourth Corps and Slim enough time because um, everyone, if everyone knows Kohima, if everyone knows Kohima, there's a lot of waffling. Do, what do we, we pull in the whole 161st Brigade? Do we pull them out? Uh, Fourth Royal Kent's go in and they're, they're there. And they're there with a, 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 a partial, like 280 soldiers from the 1st Assam Regiment that just later on this after this battle that they get hit further up the track because they're blocking in two boxes in co you know the area to Kohima. so they um they shatter the only british parachute brigade east and anyone knows paris they're highly skilled highly aggressive they're a different type of soldier they're a little more aggressive than than your regular uh probably war um drafted soldier or, vol or volunteer um that's um that that's the big point is is the week late at Kohima. It gives them time to fly in and, and infall. It gives them time to fly in units into infall and then dim, dim and pour and then reinforce Kohima. And, and the third point there, the, the plans were captured. If it were captured, what the expense? Yes. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a tragedy. Um, there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, backbiting is not the right word. Um, on the third day of, of Sangshak, they get the Japanese plans. The intelligence officer for the 50th uh, Brigade walks back to Imphal with another soldier with the exact plans the Japanese have for the whole area, for the whole operation. And they go missing. They're not in the 4th Corps' history. No one sees them being signed in. Um, you know, a little, a little bitter on the side is that that intelligence officer gets put off to a, a post, just a, a do nothing post after after he did that. And they put him in, I want to say they put him in for a military um, a military medal or M, uh, MC. Um, and he didn't get it. They, they didn't, they never, it just disappeared too. Hmm. So, um, and a lot of uh, seamen wrote, you know, he wrote the book on the Battle of Sangshak. He's bitter that the Fourth Corps didn't, um, that the fourth court didn't give the intelligence that they needed. Um, they knew, they knew it right up front. They knew it was happening and the brigade wasn't informed. And that's why they get surprised or mostly surprised at, at point 7378. And, and they put some of the references up there and obviously some famous names there, yes. World Book TV guest, Bob Lyman, James Holland there. Uh, the Lewis Allen book, I think, is a is a staple of most people watching this who understand the Burma camp. Probably got that on their shelves. Fergal Keane as well, um, an epic one. But some some great books. And you've mentioned the Harry Seaman book there Seaman as well. Book, yeah, yeah. Um, um, obviously, it, we'll, we'll go through this. You know, you've studied the papers as well. Fifteenth Army. That's worth looking at. I'm glad. That's excellent. That's good. sorry, to cut you off, Paul. That that's online. Anyone can look yeah. at that. That is a great plan. Shows you the Japanese logistics. It's a it's an official paper done after the war that the British had Japanese officers of the 15th army do. And it's just, it's excellent. It's a great reference. Uh, and then some, some websites, the Pegasus archive.org. Of course, I'm very familiar with the paradata.org very familiar with. So um, I'm glad you put your sources up there and you've pulled this together, but kind of there's the $64,000 question is, is for you, Keith is, 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 you know, how would you summarize this battle? What what would you classify it as? Is it is as I said, is it a failure? Is it a defeat? Is it a you know what? No, and I'm, what isn't it talked about more because it's a little bit difficult to kind of put a label to. It's not it's not quite got that. I don't want to say romanticism, but the, the Imphal Kohima has sort of a heroic. I mean, this has heroism as well. But how would you define it? Um, I would say it's a victory, ultimately. Because it stops Kohima. If they were to lose Kohima, yeah. they would have moved. They would have cut the road to Imphal, which they did. But they, yeah. it would have been harder to take back that ridge at Kohima, and they would have yeah. probably moved on to Demimpur with all the supply dumps up there. And that would have, that would have satisfied whatever the Japanese issues were. Yeah, I say it's, it's, I say it's, it's a about victory in, in context. If you look at it on its own, it's got a little bit of an Alamo feeling to yes, it. Yes, it does. Of course, Absolutely. you know about Alamo that that gives. Um, uh, the, the time for the Texicans to, to form the army later on and go yep. on and, and, and defeat Santa Ana. So um, 
that it's got that element of you can't look at it just on its own. It's part of a sequence of events that are leading to this. And Kahima and Imphal are, are decisive. They, they are, they are, there's the there's the bit before that era battle, and there's the bit after that, and there's been a noticeable change in who is the uncertainty of the Burma campaign has become a, a lot. Has, has moved away and that the, the allies are pretty much now going to win post those events mm -hmm. so i suppose if you treat this as part of that it is part of a victory but in isolation it's got this tragic kind of arnhem element about it yes yes it does it absolutely that's a great analogy Paul. that does arnhem they're surrounded they were told to hold and they didn't now there's a little um the fourth corps uh doesn't speak nicely about the brigade saying they ran you know, um, the British um, official histories said there were 3,500 soldiers there, and why they run from the why they run from the Japanese when they outnumbered, but they didn't. Um, they they were outnumbered. Um, Linton is a nice is another little battle behind them. Like I said, it was the um, it was the one right behind them, about six six miles back, um, supply area. So uh, yes. Yeah, it was a costly. I see, Brent. I mean, I think it, it, the, oh. the, the, some of the best shows on World War II TV are the ones that that, le that raise as many questions as they answer them. You've taken us through the sequence of events, but I think I'm not going to go away scratching my head in a good kind of way as to to what I will now want to take away from this and 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 read some more chapters of some of those books and look at look at more of, of what happened before this, but certainly look at more more about what happened after that. I think anyone watching this. It's a good prelude. It's a good. It's a good part of the Kahima story that I think people know that bit there. But this adds that, adds that kind of um, prequel uh, aspect to it, I suppose. Another book is um, the. It's the first Assam regiment. You can find it online. It's 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 a uh, it's in the archive dot com. Um, you go through it, and one of the lieutenants wrote it, and it's a. It gives the two other battles of um, Jessamy, and I'm going to mispronounce it. Cost. Kostoma, I'm going to mispronounce that, but there's two little battles inside, that they, yeah. stop, they stop this division again. Uh, they stop the 124th Regiment and give buy more time with their bodies for Kohima. So, wow. yeah, I would, I would say it's a victory. Well, there you are. I mean, that, that uh, brilliant presentation. Um, I look forward Thanks. to you coming back with something else for the future. I'm just going to take your well, mind people what we're coming up tomorrow, and I'll come back and say goodbye in a, in a minute. So, folks. Two shows coming your way tomorrow. So at 2 p.m. UK time, J.D. Hewitt from History Underground is coming on to talk about his exploration of uh, Saipan, Guam, and Tinian, which is all part of filming for his own channel. He's going to talk about what it is like visiting those areas, the terrain, the, the heat, uh, what it is to, to walk across those places there and his experiences of visiting three of those incredibly important, significant Pacific islands for the island hopping campaign. And then at 7 o'clock UK time, the incredible Sol David is coming on to talk about his new book, Devil Dogs, which actually isn't out till October. So it's not going to be a fully fledged kind of bang out the park kind of presentation about the book because it's not ready. yet. It's going to be a discussion between me and Sol about his process of writing it, looking at sources, how he's put together the picture of the campaign of the, Mar of the Marines in you know, Guadalcanal, Peleliu, places like that. So a bit of a discussion between myself and Sol about his latest project. So two great shows tomorrow. We've got John McManus coming up later in the week. Jeffrey Roker's coming on to talk about missing Marines. And we've got the Cara breakout on Monday of this battle in Australia. So lots of stuff coming your way. So as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to bring Keith back in to say goodbye. So crack cracking um, uh, first show. Oh, and you, so I'm really glad that people like yourself contact me who have just been studying something who, who would like to share it with others because as I say, it's important to bring people on from all different backgrounds. And it's just my, my hat off to you virtually and, and physically to, for, for studying thank this you. and bringing it to light. So thank you very much. So, um, well, cheers. So this is with us for two TV. I will see you all again tomorrow for two shows. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. But